I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I'd like to first respond to two questions that came into the chat um, that are about meditation in general. The first question was um, visible uh, at 40 minutes past the hour from Farah, who wrote, what if at the middle of the meditation, a strong negative feeling comes up? Should we stop the loving kindness meditation and be attentive to those feelings or just ignore them and continue focusing on the loving kindness meditation? It's a great question. Um, and my answer to it, uh, from a lot of experience with this, including how I answer it for myself, is that it depends. In other words, sometimes it's really helpful to uh, recognize something that's come up. Like maybe you realize that you're preoccupied with a interaction you had with someone recently or some kind of messy, frustrating task at work. And it's just useful to take a few minutes, maybe a little more, and use the meditative frame as, an, as a helpful, skillful, supportive frame in which you can explore that material, whatever all that is. Um, sometimes that's, that's really helpful to do. Other times the material comes up, maybe you be with it, you kind of see what's there for some breaths, a minute, and then you realize, okay, you know, um, maybe that's familiar material. Maybe it's something you can think about later. And maybe you can recognize that the mind is presenting it as a kind of way to distract you habitually away from what would be more valuable to you to rest in. I'm myself, uh, both very motivated, uh, you know, aiming aiming high on the path and, and ma that mattering to me, I care about that on the one hand. And on the way, I, I'm personally quite pragmatic. For me, what the whole, the point basically is to rest increasingly in increasingly healed, effective, and um, liberated ways of being. And so meditation is a fantastic uh, neurological <laughs> training in what we are inclining ourselves toward. So for me, my you know a meditative way to think about meditation is to rest your mind on what draws your heart, and so that you increasingly live into more and more stably ways of being that you value based on whatever it is that you value, including as the next reachable step, the next step in reach in your own practice. Uh, so if it's pragmatically useful to do a little psychotherapy for five or 10 minutes on the cushion, good. If that helps you suffer less and harm yourself and others less, great. Other times you may realize, you know, I've been doing a lot of psychotherapy on the cushion and some things have improved, but a lot is same old, same old. And maybe it would be helpful for me to try to look at something underneath all those issues. That's more the space in which they're occurring or the container in which they're occurring. So that maybe it would be helpful to me to learn how to rest in a ground of being that is itself free of those psychological issues inherently. Yeah. Okay. A uh, second question came in earlier. It might have been private to me. I sent, oh, here we go. I think it was from Dan. Jed, 53 minutes past the previous hour. Is it best to meditate without a goal? Again, a very deep question. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> it for me, it's hard to imagine 
uh, sitting down and disengaging from our daily activities without some sort, some sort of purpose behind that or valuing of that activity because we're making a choice. Choices always involve values. We're choosing this direction, which is a goal, over that direction. So as a frame, uh, we meditate um, in the context of our values. It's because we value it. Okay. Inside that context, though, very important, uh, there are extremely profound meditative practices that um, involve a real radical uh, lessening of any kind of gaining mind, as it's put in Zen, any kind of goal-directed activity. Open awareness, um, the goal there is to be stably present while not having any goals with regard to what appears in consciousness. To go further, if you will, in shikantaza, just sitting, zazen, as I understand it, particularly the soto forms of that through Dogen, uh, is a real radical letting go of, uh, of identity into being lived by whatever arises and moves through us without any gaining mind at all. On the other hand, sometimes it's very useful and the Buddha laid out um, a whole path. Sometimes it's very useful to cultivate certain particular qualities of, for example, tranquility, one of the seven factors of awakening. Other qualities being mindfulness, uh, or other factors of awakening being mindfulness, um, investigation, effort, commitment, energy, uh, tranquility, uh, bliss, concentration, deep absorption states, and equanimity. There are more than seven factors of awakening, but that's a pretty good list of seven, right? Uh, so we cultivate those. Maybe we cultivate vipassana, in other words, insight into impermanence. We're cultivating those things. So we have goals. We're developing those things. Um, in this online program, uh, I tend to focus on uh, meditations that are about cultivating certain qualities uh, because that's also easier to keep people engaged when they're looking at a computer screen. Uh, and also because um, I think... Uh, a lot of us, particularly who are householders, are you know interested in cultivating certain useful qualities, certain useful factors. So I tend to tilt that way. But on the other hand, um, I've also gotten a lot of value out of practices in which, other than the minimal stabilization of present moment awareness as a goal, as it were, as a value, other than that, it's all falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> what remains when it all falls apart, in a sense? And the, the grout in the tiles of the mosaic of the apparent self start evaporating. What's left? Yeah. Okay. So I'd like to talk with you in a way that um, is careful about uh, current events. I think on the one hand, there's a place for finding refuge in, an, in a gathering in which nobody's talking about current events. There's a real place for that. On the other hand, I know that current events are a source of suffering for many people in this gathering, and obviously many, many, many more people in the world. And so I want to explore with you, in a way, a way of approaching all this in the frame of some important themes in Buddhist practice. Now, I want to be really clear with you here, and we're going to enforce it. I am not interested at all in your views about policy in this context. I do not want you to offer them. I do not want you to offer your opinions about history or world events. I'm only interested here, as the Buddha was interested, 
in the processes inside your own mind. Definitely do not comment on what other people put in the chat. And those, um, my friends who are stewards here, notably George Klein and a couple of others, will actually remove people uh, if they violate these, um, for me, um, frames to enable us to have a kind of safe place here. All right? So, okay, got it? So to repeat, please, please do not offer historical information, do not offer links to other sources, do not offer your opinions about history or events or what should happen or who's more responsible or less responsible. Let's stay inside the frame of our practice, strictly. I'm not saying that those offerings are bad in other settings. I have my own thoughts about these various things. I am not going to share them with you, <laughs> much as I'm asking you to renounce sharing them with others. Okay? I'm seeing support for that in the chat, so I appreciate that. Okay? Um, so I want to highlight some, some Buddhist themes, if you will, and they're not the property of Buddhism. They're foregrounded in Buddhist practice, is all I'm saying. So I want to speak about one of the elements of the Eightfold Path, right intention. What's our motivation here as we approach our own minds? We could add that to our motivation as we approach the world. Okay, But particularly as we approach our own minds. What are proper, according to the Buddha, and proper as in pragmatically beneficial for you and others? What are wise or right intentions? The Buddha highlighted three. We could put them in order. There's probably no particular order. They're all important. The first intention is to renounce attachment to pleasures. It's not, my video should be working. Thanks, Tracy. I like your last name, by the way, Tracy Stillwater, if that's your last name. I was born in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Seems like an auspicious name <laughs> for a birthplace, Stillwater. So anyway, I think it's working. Um, <clears throat> my point is, um, Renouncing attachment to pleasures. Now, we don't renounce pleasures. The Buddha experienced pleasures, including the pleasure of bliss and the pleasure of community with others, two well-known pleasures he commented on. Um, but we can renounce attachment to pleasures, including the pleasures of righteousness, the pleasures of dogmatism, the pleasures of... Um, indulging quick reactions online. These are pleasures. These are rewarding. Um, anger in the Buddhist proverb with its honeyed tip, the pleasure, that initial burst of anger that can have pleasure in it, in which reward neurochemicals, dopamine and norepinephrine, they have other functions as well, but those molecules motivate us to do stuff, like get angry and stay angry. The honeyed tip of anger and its poisoned barb. So these, these are pleasures. So being mindful of renouncing um, attachment, clinging, grasping to those various pleasures. I understand, Brenda, that the chocolate mousse you're eating does not like what I'm saying. And my attitude is enjoy it. Live well meanwhile, okay? Second, in right intention, you can consider the relevance of this to the moment, is um, the intention of non-harming, including yourself. You know, not harming um, uh, yourself. Just think about doom scrolling. Yeah. Think about uh, getting angry at the television set. 
<laughs> my wife has teased me when I'm watching a bunch of talking heads on a news discussion program. I'll say, you know, they, they didn't say it right. Or she's like laughing at me. I'm talking to the television. You know, it's not particularly good for me. Um, Non-harming and also not harming others. I uh, love this increasingly well-recognized teaching from Larry Yang. Someone may have access to it. It would be really good to put in the chat for others. Uh, it was visible on the bulletin board in the week of silent retreat I did at Spirit Rock and just came back from. Essentially, to paraphrase Larry Yang says, essentially, may I, may I have love for everyone? If I cannot have love for everyone, you know, may I have love for some and kindness for everyone else? I'm paraphrasing. If I cannot have kindness, may I have compassion? If I cannot have compassion, at least may I not harm. And if I uh, am still harming, may I harm as may I harm as little as possible. It's in that frame that we take on board this motivation, this intention of non-harming, and. It can get really interesting when you think about a little snippy comment, you think about a little eye roll, a little, <laughs> you know, uh, a little claim of superiority, like I know more than you. You know, the subtle forms of harming. And we also, I think, harm when we harbor um, the third thing that the Buddha referred to here, ill will. This is the third intention, the intention of not harboring ill will as the third aspect of right intention. Ill will is really interesting. And I find that there's an extremely fruitful exploration of what it is to see clearly including to see others clearly and their persistent behavior and to see the results of their actions? How do we hold clear seeing? How do we also hold understandable um, outrage, including moral outrage? Moral outrage overlaps with anger, but it's distinct from anger. We can rest, moral outrage does itself have its honeyed tip. We have to be careful about it. Outrage is a close cousin to disgust, which arguably is one of the very first emotions to evolve in our history. The Technically, the, the capacity for that emotion evolving in our history. And um, disgust is very close you know, to spitting out feeling contaminated, and then by extension, regarding others as disgusting, contaminated, evil, horrible, right? You know? Um, so anyway, outrage, you know, can get pretty close to disgust, but still, there's a place, I think, for outrage at certain um, terrible forms of harm. How do we have clear seeing how do we allow a certain fieriness about what's harmful, what's in, what's in, what's um, un, you know, terrible, without succumbing to the poison of ill will? That's a real practice. It's an ongoing challenge. I look to people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Thich Nhat Hanh. Maybe someone might find a link to a classic photograph of the two of them when Thich Nhat Hanh came to America in the early 1960s to bear witness to and participate in the American Civil Rights Movement while he was at that time exiled from his home country, Vietnam, because he dared to speak out for the sake of peace there. Uh, there's a beautiful photograph of the two of them, a black and white photograph. Um, and you can just see the dignity the clear seeing, to some extent the outrage, without being invaded and occupied by ill will. So it's, a, it's an aspiration, but I'm naming it, right? So we can bring to our own minds and to this current moment 
the intention of renouncing attachment to pleasures of various kinds that are problematic. And we can bring the intention of non-harming, including ourselves, you know. And we can bring the intention of not harboring ill will. Or as Larry Yang puts it so eloquently, and I'm paraphrasing, harboring as little ill will as possible. Okay? A second main current of Buddhist teaching that I think is relevant here it is found in what the Buddha noted as the three characteristics of certainly our own experiences, the mind. And more generally, most if not the better part of all of reality altogether. And what are those three characteristics? In Pali, the language of early Buddhism, uh, they are uh, the words of um, anicca, which means impermanence, change, constant change. Another is um, anatta, which broadly means that everything uh, arises due to causes and conditions interdependently. Thich Nhat Hanh called it interbeing. Everything's related to everything else, okay? Uh, and everything exists relationally. And third, the truth, uh, the characteristic of dukkha, which is routinely mistranslated as suffering or unsatisfactoriness. Dukkha is simply the fact that um, there are sometimes unpleasant experiences that we must bear. Also, pleasant experiences end, as all experiences end, because they're impermanent. And experiences are inherently insubstantial and empty of essence and solidity, so that we so that trying to hold on to them is a sure prescription for suffering. Anicca, ananta, dukkha. Okay? Now this all can get super intellectual. I don't want it to get there. I'm not going to go there. How does it relate? Well, <clears throat> we can first of all apply the recognition of change ongoing change, dynamism, transience, to our own mind stream. Here we are right now, maybe feeling heartbroken, maybe outraged, maybe appalled, maybe scared, uh, maybe tired of having to think about this stuff. Same old, same old, whatever, whatever it might be. You know, beautiful feelings of love and loyalty and and caring for others, um, you know, those two, anicca, impermanence, transience. The Buddha, uh, one of the fundamental teachings that he emphasized, as he put it, those who recognize impermanence are truly recognizing the heart of my teaching, in effect. It's that central. Um, one way to then apply impermanence into the world, and this is important, is to be able to be committed to relieving suffering and cherishing that which is and accepting our understandable human social primate reactions of grief and outrage to loss of various kinds. It's to... In include that and hold that in the larger perspective of time. Think of the time in which the Buddha lived, 2,500 years ago, in which rulers, warfare, warlords, <clears throat> just <laughs> came and went. Um, you know, just think about the casual atrocities of the Bronze Age, armies slaughtering whole cities. Uh, during World War II, I recently found out that, I believe this is factually true, over uh, something on the order of two nights, uh, Allied bombing of the city of Hamburg uh, killed 100,000 people there. 
civilians. And, you know, re through the entire war, my understanding is something like around 60,000 civilians were killed in, in Great Britain. And I'm not saying any of this to make a point about right or wrong or anything. I'm just making a larger point about um, bringing a kind of long time span perspective to current events. Think about events that seemed so appalling and because they were appalling a year or two ago that are no longer in our awareness. And my emphasis here is not on trivializing or dismissing anything. It's simply recognizing the truth of impermanence applied to our own experiences and also applied to events in the world. And I myself find um, a kind of fierce wisdom in the recognition of impermanence. You know, it's a chilly wisdom. <laughs> Because part of what's impermanent is this hand, and this mind, this body, right? But there's a kind of chilly freedom, at least for me is how I would put it, a kind of cool, clear, liberating freedom in the deep recognition of impermanence. Then we have the, third, the second characteristic of uh, anatta. Uh, Atman was the notion of an eternal soul that arose unconditionally and persisted throughout all conditions. The Buddha argued against that, and more broadly, he and his time, and then really built out uh, in the teachings of um, uh, the Mahayana tradition, moving through Tibet and China into, into Japan, the recognition of interdependent arising. Everything is connected relationally. And we can look at our own experiences in that way. Oh, why am I having this feeling? Well, of course I'm having this feeling. Uh, let's say my lineage is Jewish. Of course I'm having this feeling. My lineage, let's say, is Arabic or Islamic. Or of course I'm having this feeling. Um, you know, I've been a career military person in the military. Of course I'm having this feeling, given all the other causes and conditions in my life, right? Um, and it's not to trivialize it. Try it. The next time you're upset about something, of course I'm upset about this, with the wisdom that recognizes that the upset uh, is impermanent and it may not be entirely justified, and it may be problematic to identify with and act out, blah, blah. But as an experience, of course I'm feeling this because it was caused. It was caused. Of course I'm feeling this way. You know, because of the ways in which each of us is like a local quivering in the vast fabric of reality and culture, right, and history. We're, we're each of us rippling away, you know? Um, and so uh, that, that might help you, that recognition applied to yourself of interdependent arising related to the experiences you're having here, you know? When, and there's a, there are aspects of this that really have a sweetness in it. It's like you're not dismissing what you're experiencing. You're valuing, you're honoring it. You're legitimizing it. Of course, this, this wave in the whole Pacific Ocean is twitching and quivering right away because of an earthquake a thousand miles away. Of course, it's twitching and quivering right now in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You know, of course, I'm feeling this way. And then more broadly, you know, regarding events in the world, as the result of a vast complex of causes and conditions, which does not um, evade moral culpability. We can clearly recognize causes and conditions, while at the same time, and this was really interesting by the Buddha, at the same time, absolutely emphasizing personal responsibility. 
for what we do ourselves. You know, it's a really quite profound to recognize at the historical level. You think about events in the Middle East, and you think about you know the last five hundred years. Think about the last three thousand years, the last five thousand years, and all those causes and conditions, and then spread out throughout the entire world, rippling together to make this moment. We can we don't need a PhD in Middle Eastern history to have a sense, an intuitive awareness of the vast forces at work. And in that recognition, you know, is both compassion, a heart broken open, tenderness for so much suffering. So much suffering. There is so much blood in that land. Uh, I got to visit the Mediterranean um, several years ago, and I was walking around islands in um, in the Mediterranean and a large island, Crete, and walking around Greece. And you would look down, and you would see the foundations of a fort or a home, and you would just know there's a there's thousands of years of blood in that ground. So much suffering, oi, right? And also a recognition of the vastness of the forces at work. And none of this means that we just throw up our hands. It means that we bring wisdom, as the Buddha did, to uh, the work that we can do. I think of the teaching from Nikosi Johnson, this beautiful boy in South Africa, born with HIV, AIDS. Uh, mother died of AIDS fairly soon after he was born. And anyway, he became a, na he became a national spokesperson. You can look him up, Nikosi Johnson, N-K-O-S-I-E, O-S-I, in Wikipedia. And to paraphrase or get close to a key teaching he offered, do what you can with what you've been given in the place where you are in the time that you have. So we can hold this perspective of anatta, of interdependent arising, of vast causes applied to our own experiences and applied to the state of the world, while also do, doing all that we can with what we've been given, including, certainly speaking for myself, with the advantages and accumulating privileges that we've been given in the place where we are, with the power that we do have, in the time that we have. And then last, there is the characteristic of dukkha, which is uh, the fact that, you know, sometimes we're upset about things. Sometimes our heart aches. Sometimes we're scared. Sometimes we, our heart aches for those whose heart aches, right? Um, can we accept these experiences as part of living? We might practice with them in some ways. We might nudge them in one direction with wisdom over time. But can we include, as the Buddha taught, dukkha? There is dukkha. That was the first ennobling truth for us all to face. There is dukkha. There are unpleasant experiences, pleasant experiences, and no experience is capable of possession. Dukkha. Can we apply that to our own experiences here and not uh, suffer what's called dukkha dukkha, in which we get upset that we're upset? You know, we get mad that we're mad, for example. Um, and can we allow our experiences related to world events to flow? You know, think of what happens when water gets backed up, it becomes stagnant. Think about what happens in the heart if love gets backed up and obstructed 
and stagnant. It gets kind of fetid and smelly. <laughs> Let it go. As I was talking before we began formally in Ajahn Chah Tat, um, if you let go a little, he taught, you'll have a little peace or happiness. If you let go a lot, you'll have a lot of peace. If you let go completely, you'll be completely peaceful. All right? So letting it flow, letting yourself flow and being kind to yourself. So I want to finish here um, with, a, with a moment of kindness for yourself. It's scary. I mean, I doubt there's anyone here who is right now in the middle of effectively a war zone. If so, blessing, bless you. But even if we're not in the middle of a war zone, whew, we can be really affected in all kinds of ways. Personally, I don't mind saying, um, I've been meditating since 1974, off and on the first couple decades, definitely on the last uh, 30 years. And the older I get, the calmer I get, and the madder I get <laughs> at this unnecessary suffering in the world. And um, I'm angry at the forces of concentrated wealth and power in, in so many ways that have perpetuated and conditions in the world that are good for the few, okay for some, and pretty crappy for most, and terrible, terrible for many. Um, you may feel the same way. We can be kind to ourselves. I'm trying to be kind to myself about how it is for me about all this. So let's take a moment here of practice. Yeah. Kindness for yourself. Like how it's hard for you. Of course it's hard for you, right? In certain ways. You might draw on the body memory of the soothing, the tranquilizing in the meditation. You might draw on the body memory of heartness, heartfeltness, including for yourself. And then more broadly, in whatever way feels authentic for you and within reach. May we broaden that circle of good wishes outward from ourselves, first of all, to include those who are here in our gathering. I'm seeing many faces and many names. May you be well. I'll be quiet for a moment here as you may have soft thoughts like, may you not suffer. May you find peace. And then widening out, you know, in whatever way is real for you. And there may be limitations in your extension of kindness and good wishes. It's okay. As Larry Yang pointed out, you know, may we do the best we can. May we extend our good wishes here out through so many oppressed communities in the world native people, people discriminated against systemically,
and certainly extending out to people harmed by the forces of war and occupation and violence. Wishing them well. Knowing that we are very limited in what we can make happen, but we are not limited. in the givingness, the good wishing. The compassion spreading out from ourselves. And based on a comment that just came in the chat, I want to do something I don't think I've ever done before. Maybe you've done it yourself. Um, See if you can continue your good wishing into the future. As some, as Margaret wrote, the traumas around the world will hurt generations to come. Imagine our good wishes rippling forward in time. in the hours to come, the days to come, in the weeks and years to come. Soothing, easing, perhaps rippling forward for centuries to come. And finishing here, throughout all this, the Buddha taught, as best we know, that paraphrase it, you should find gladness in your goodness. You should delight in your own practice, he taught. You should recognize amidst your warts, you know, I I have faults. I, I have things I'm definitely working on. And, you know, there's a value in recognizing your own goodness your own good intentions, the goodness of your practice right here. You know, staying present, staying with it here tonight, um, letting yourself be moved in helpful ways as you were. Honoring and respecting your own practice, your own sincerity. Good for you. And finding gladness in our goodness is in the service of sustaining the strength, the moral commitments, the compassion, the skillfulness that our world, as as it has always needed it, so sorely needs today. Thank you for your kind attention.